A lot of people associate Scranton with coal mining, and this is very important that you see this when you come to Scranton, because this was our bread and butter. This was our heritage for over 150 years. It's something that should be preserved, and we feel very strongly about it. But the Lackawanna coal mine tour is more than just a history lesson. It's a slightly scary, very unusual ride into the earth. What you see on the tour, you ride down about 1,300 feet on the mine car, and then you get out, you walk 800 feet in through the mine workings on a guided tour, and then you walk and turn around and come back 800 feet back to the original point. Once you're down about 250 feet below the Earth's surface, you're walking in what's called the Clark Vein. Now, 25 or 30 years ago, when all the mines were working and the pumps were pumping, you could go down that chamber, it would level off, and you could walk seven miles across the valley. You could come out underneath the baseball stadium where the Scranton Wilkesbury Red Barons play, or the Montage Ski Area. That's how far you could travel. All of the tour guides have mine working experience. Some people call everybody that came underground a miner. That's not so. They were actually mine workers. A mine worker was anybody that came underground. A miner was a special person in charge of his place and the only one that could blast and handle dynamite legally. Anthracite coal is hard, and you didn't mine it with a pick. They drilled holes into the coal. Miners inserted dynamite, then exploded it to loosen the coal. Now, after they blast, there's a lot of smoke and a lot of dust, so they can't come right back in here and begin to work. They have to let it clear out about a half an hour. Then the miner comes in, he's the one in charge, and he checks the air with a safety lamp. Now, before the safety lamps, they actually used to bring birds down in cages, canaries, and they would check for gas. They still constantly monitor conditions down here, and it's definitely easier to look around than it used to be. Okay, when you worked in the coal mine, this is all the light that you had, just what you have in your head. Now, the old timers, they had a light about half as bright as this, it was called a carbide lamp. Before the carbide lamp, an oil wick kerosene lamp like the mule driver and the nipper wore, it was about the light of a birthday candle. That's how much light it would show. Now, if you bumped your light or you got it wet, it would go out. That's how dark it would be. Now, look at that. And what you'd have to do, you'd have to try to find the track with your foot. Drag your foot along the track, make your way back until you met someone else. So just imagine doing that. Wow. Are there any questions besides when am I getting you out of here? <laughs> Hot summer days, we're booming here. Everybody wants to go and get cooled off. It's only 50 degrees down there, so that's nature's air conditioning. On a hot day, the tour will lend you a jacket. This mine closed back in 1966. Nowadays, there's little demand for anthracite coal. Please be careful, kid. Now watch your head. How you doing? The biggest fascination is being underground, I think, 250 feet, and seeing what your ancestors did for the last 150 years. People cannot believe the way people worked, how they worked on their stomachs and their hands and knees, and how hard they worked just to, to provide a day's pay for their family. It kind of gives people a different outlook when they come out today. I've heard so many people say that, boy, I won't complain about my job anymore, at least for a while anyway. <laughs> In 1900, a new president came to the White House. Theodore Roosevelt's style was different from Grover Cleveland's, and as he would demonstrate, so was his attitude towards labor. In 1902, the Pennsylvania coal miners walked out of the mines in a wage dispute. Their struggle and Teddy Roosevelt's role in it was to mark a turning point in labor history. It's dark as a dungeon and damp as the dew Where dangers are doubled and pleasures are few Where the rain never falls and the sun never shines It's dark as a dungeon way down in the 
the mine. The leader of the miners was willing to settle the strike by arbitration. But the head of the mine owners was definitely not. The rights of the miners must and will be protected, not by labor agitators, but by the Christian men to whom God has given control of the property interests of this country. Bear's presumptuousness only angered the miners. They determined not to go back to work until they had improved their conditions. Come all you young fellows, so young and so fine. Seek not your fortune way down in the mine. It'll form as a habit and dampen your soul. Till the stream of your blood runs as black as the coal. By autumn, the threat of a coal famine hung over the nation. New Yorkers lined up to buy coconut shells for fuel. Theodore Roosevelt determined to move. Enraged by what he called the stupid arrogance of the mine owners, he decided to take over the Pennsylvania mines in the name of the government and start the coal rolling again. The mere rumor of a government takeover of their property made the owners quickly agree to mediation. The result was a federally appointed strike commission which granted the workers a nine hour day and a 10% wage increase. Roosevelt's intervention was a landmark in American labor history. The first time the government had judged a labor dispute without automatically taking management's side. But once Roosevelt left office, as events would show, the rights of the working man were still far from secure. May troubles are o'er, Mrs. Murphy, if the Dutchman next door tells me straight that the breaker starts full time on Monday. That's what he tells me any rate. Sure, the boss he told Mickey this morning as he were about entering the mine that the coal is quite scarce down round Philly. So the breakers will start up full time. And it's all sure if the news. The second test they did was a roof test, because the number one problem in a coal mine, as far as accidents are concerned, are roof falls. And it was a simple test. 
Uh, the guys that came here when anthracite uh, expanded rapidly, many of them didn't even understand English as they came from Eastern and Southern Europe. But when they came here, they learned how to protect themselves. And it's a simple test, and I bet you you can tell me yourself, maybe never even being in a mine, what is good roof and what is bad roof by listening to the sound. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. Listen to the sound. Now, where do we want to eat lunch? <laughs> there you go. See that? Everybody's an expert. Okay. I'm a celebrated working man, my duties I don't shirk. I can dig more coal than any man from Scranton to New York. It's a whole interrogation, boys, how I go through me work while I sit atop me glory in the bar room. I can show the boss or super how the air should circulate. I can show the greatest fireman how the steam should generate. And trouble in the deepest shaft I could eradicate. Why, sure, I proved it often in the bar room. I'll go down and work the flat vein. I'll go up and work the pits. I can work the pits or Marvin, I don't care the devil which. I can show the old track layer how to decorate the ditch. Why, sure, I proved it often in the bar. Now, Barney, dear, don't hurt yourself. I heard me Molly cry. Ah, sure, I won't, I says to her. A careful man am I. Tis a miner's everlasting fear of in the mines to die. And I've worried about it often in the bar room. Ended, and I hope you'll all agree If it's pointers that you're needing And you better send for me But I'm not worth a tinker's dam Till I've emptied two or three Of the very biggest schooners in the bar room Of the very biggest schooners in the bar room How low did coal get in Pennsylvania? 18-inch veins were mined, a little less than half of that. The posture, of course, was done with these things here called knee pads. They spend their eight-hour shift. Before, the first thing they did was put their knee pads on. They had straps on them, strap them on, and they spent their eight-hour shifts working in what they called monkey veins. For obvious reasons, they were on all fours. Uh, I hear you moaning. I am a jovial collier lad, as blithe as blithe can be. And let the times be good or bad, it's all the same to me. It's little of this world I know, and care less for its ways. For where a dark star never glows, I wear away my day.
And like the clothing on my back, my speech is rough and plain. Well, if I stumble with my tongue, I've one excuse to say. It's not a collier's heart that's bad, it's his head that goes astray. the anthracite industry was on a downward track that started at the close of World War II. Still, in 1959, deep mining continued to be an important economic prop in a time of countrywide recession. Some 10,000 men labored underground in northeastern Pennsylvania. The major coal companies had faded from the scene and had leased their profit-thin workings to independent contractors. One such operation was the Knox Mine at Port Griffith near Pittston in Luzerne County. What occurred there on January 22, 1959, would end deep mining in the Wyoming Valley forever. It was an event of great tragedy and great drama, the Knox disaster. It was 20 minutes before noon when it happened. The Susquehanna River smashed through the roof of a mined out chamber and began pouring a mighty torrent of water into the underground tunnels. There were 81 men at work at Knox when the water began surging through the mine. 36 got to the surface in cages at the May and Hoyt shafts before the water put the elevators out of operation. They were out in a matter of minutes, and then it became obvious that 45 others were trapped below. A volunteer force worked desperately meantime to seal the opening in the river bed. The enormity of that battle was dramatized by the spectacular attempt to plug the hole with railroad cars. The hoppers looked like children's bathtub toys as they whirled around in the vortex and disappeared. By this time, the news had spread around the world. Families of the missing miners gathered at the scene and watched numbly. Mining communities knew and understood such old enemies as rock slides, explosions, and gas. This was different. Then, at 4 o'clock that day, with hope and light dimming, a water-soaked figure appeared at the surface opening of an abandoned air shaft a couple of hundred yards upstream from the river Whirlpool. The electrifying news brought rescue workers and waiting relatives to the new focal point of the drama. One by one, seven men struggled upward to escape the watery trap. Though dozens remained below, the good fortune of the seven sent hope soaring. Surveyor Joseph Stella had found the exit by using a blueprint of the maze of tunnels below. At 4.30 p.m., the grim arithmetic stood at 43 men safe, 38 not accounted for. The vigil started again with all eyes on the old air shaft, the only possible avenue of escape. 
At 6.45 p.m., a rescue worker flashing a light into the shaft heard voices echoing through the tunnels below, then laughter and shouts of joy. The word went out, survivors, more survivors. Off-duty nurses hearing the news on radio and television flocked to the Pittston Hospital, which had been alerted to make ready all available beds. The hospital staff so distinguished itself that night that community honors were to pour in later. Twenty-six grimy, exhausted miners were brought to the hospital. One of them, Peter Krawicki, told about his experience. I knew where the highest spots were, so I, the only thing I could do was keep going to the highest spots. Mm -hmm. You were on the move all the time? All the time, all the time. We didn't dare stop at all. How deep was the water when you left it? Well, the highest where I was was, was, over my, was over my knees. When I seen that we couldn't uh, make any headway, I had the men turn around, go back up to the highest point. Then we kept circling around, walking around, until we finally spied a light. Where the second opening was, we spied a light, we started hollering, and we knew that we were safe then. In the joy of the moment, it was momentarily forgotten that the 26 men in the group saved left the survival total 12 short of the 81 in the mine. That grim fact was soon evident in the sobs of wives and children who waited at the hospital in vain and in the roster lists with 12 names unchecked. Many seemed to sense at the moment that there would be no more survivors, no more tired, wet miners gratefully gulping down straight shots of rye whiskey. As the minute hand of the clock made its last sweep on January 22nd, experienced observers were in agreement that the only chance the trapped miners had was to find an air pocket and wait for the growing army of volunteer workers to stop the flow of water. Mammoth trucks lumbered in and out with their cargoes of rock, straw, telephone poles, anything that could be dumped into the vortex. Daring drivers courted death time and again as they backed their ponderous vehicles to the edge of the opening. As Friday dawned, the magnitude of the disaster was also coming into focus. Mine Secretary Thomas Kennedy warned that every mine in the Wyoming Valley would be put out of operation unless the water could be checked. The U.S. Bureau of Mines shut down 11 operations in the area, and 10,000 men were out of work. The water had started seeping into a mine two miles from the disaster point. The widening news of the disaster brought top government officials to the scene. Pennsylvania Governor David Lawrence, sworn into office only two days before, hurried to Pittston for a first-hand look and an offer of help. I'm sure that both uh, parties in the legislature will join with me in uh, providing whatever we feel is necessary to uh, help the situation. Governor Lawrence, did you uh, come up here tonight of your own accord, or were you requested to come up here by somebody? Well, uh, we were uh, uh, alarmed yesterday immediately, and, and we asked Secretary Kennedy, and he's been on the job, and I was in Shemokin, and uh, I, I, it's been on my mind all day, and I felt that I wanted to come up firsthand and see just what it was, and then I would have a better knowledge, too. And so I'm uh, being briefed by um, Mr. Kennedy, and I, I think I'll go with him out to this mine and just see firsthand what it is. Uh, when, you, when you're when you on the job and you see the thing, I, I always feel you can do a better job. United Mine Workers President Thomas Kennedy, a native of Luzerne County, was also an early arrival at the disaster site. Mr. Kennedy, after just having returned from the disaster scene, how would you uh, rate this tragedy with others in the past history of the anthracite industry? Well, this is one of the most tragic, I think. <clears throat> We've had many others, but they didn't last this long. It seems to be that if they can stop this hole, block it up, and I think they're making headway, I think they're over the top. Then, of course, will become the rescue work and the pumping. But I think everything is being done that's possible under all the circumstances. From your long experience, sir, do you think there's any chance of uh, rescuing the 12 men who are still trapped in the mine? Well, I hope so. It took several days to slow the flow of water into the Knox mine. It took months to finally seal the opening. In the meantime, hope for the 12 missing miners faded and disappeared. And as it did, the question started. How could it have happened? How could experienced men have mined right to the riverbed? The Pennsylvania Mines Department set up a board of inquiry in an attempt to discover answers. One of the most dramatic bits of testimony came from assistant foreman Jack Williams, who may have been the only eyewitness to the actual breakthrough. 
Williams had been told about the ominous sound of cracking timber. He clambered up a slope when a terrifying sight stopped him cold. And I didn't have time to even put my foot up when it just gave way just like thunder and lightning and the water came right down past me and down the slope. And I knew there was no, nothing it could do for them three fellas. So I just beat up the slope and I called Bob Groves from the engine house over to the main shaft. I told Bob, I said, Bob, you better get the men out of the main shaft, the rubber's broken. He said, oh, Christ, no, no, Jack. No, he said, oh, oh no, Jack. I said, don't have to God, Bob. I said, you better get them out. I said, I've lost three men. The Mines Department hearing raised troubling issues, and a special investigating committee was created by the Pennsylvania General Assembly. The focus of the probe narrowed to August Lippi, a high official of the United Mine Workers who proved a most reluctant witness. I refuse to answer on the advice of counsel and for the reasons stated by counsel. Are you interested in helping the miners in the Wilkes-Barre Scranton area? I stand by my previous answer. You say you don't want to reply. You don't have well, to say you stand by your answer. Just tell me you want to take... Uh, you're not going to put words into my I'm mouth. I'm not trying to put words into your mouth. Okay. But you're not just answering the way you want to answer either. I, I'll answer the way I want to answer. Lippy was ultimately named as a secret owner of the Knox Mine, his union connections helping to allow dangerous mining practices to go uncorrected. The events of January 22, 1959, have left a grim legacy. An entire industry closed down. 10,000 jobs vanished. At the scene itself, time has brought great changes. The hole in the riverbed was finally sealed with concrete, and the Susquehanna rolls quietly past the spot where it took its disastrous detour. And somewhere below are the remains of 12 miners. We talk often of the legacy left behind, cavernous voids beneath us where so many plumbed the earth for the anthracite that would make so few so rich. Part of the legacy, though, has more to do with the spirit of a people, the resilience, and even the humor in the face of death. Okay, Mike, start the drill. David Fellin, Henry Throne, and Louis Bova are trapped underground. Slow and painstaking, the drilling goes on for weeks, And sure enough, up he comes, Henry Throne first. But David Fellin knows he's next, and there's song in his heart. You must have lost a lot of weight. You're coming up easy. You think you're in the tunnel of love? Yeah, in the tunnel of love is right. That's what I was thinking about down there. You know what I Oh, it's a beautiful night in Chicago. After a litany of wise cracks and one-liners, David Fellin is above ground again. The sound of those who wait. The 1st of March, 1977, and the walls come tumbling down at the Coker coal mine in Tower City. Well, I'm hoping and wishing that he's alive and they get to him and he's safe and they get him out of there. Little does Ronald Adley's brother realize that Adley will be the only one out of ten to survive. The personalities and souls of these men colored this shades of gray world. And when we talk about the legacy of King Cole, it'd do good to remember them. And I knew there was no, nothing I could do for them three fellas. So I just beat up the slope and I called Bob Groves from the engine house over to the main shaft. I told Bob, I said, Bob, you better get the men out of the main shaft, the rubber's broken. He said, oh, Christ, no, 
No, Jack. No. I said, oh, oh, no, Jack. I said, don't have to go, Bob. I said, you better get the motor. I said, I've lost three men. <laughs> <laughs>